Uh, Kim, are we are we ready? Are we ready to go? In which case, I will say good morning and introduce myself again. I'm I'm Larry Jewell from the Edmonton Pride Seniors Group, and I do want to thank you all for uh, for attending. Um, uh, this is our regular Aging with Pride discussion group for GLBTQ. To uh, S plus uh, seniors and their allies. Uh, I want to thank as well our partners, Sage and the Pride Center of Edmonton. And before I introduce our speaker today, I must acknowledge that we are located on Treaty Six territory and respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations. Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our community. Our speaker today is Blair McKinnon uh, from Edmonton Pride Seniors Group. Blair is deeply involved in the group's efforts to establish GLBTQ 2S plus friendly housing here in Edmonton. Uh, originally from uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia, and educated at St. Francis Xavier University in Antigonish. He then moved west and joined the Alberta Provincial Civil Service. He spent 30 years working there and served in a variety of capacities, uh, uh, including project coordinator for a number of innovative uh, projects delivered through Alberta Health Services primary care networks. Now retired, he and his husband travel widely in Canada and COVID permitting across the globe. He is here today to uh, give us an overview of EPSG's housing project. Thank you, Blair, and welcome. Thank you very much, Larry. I'll just uh, get the share screen here. Great, welcome. Um, uh, great to see so many people here. Um, today I'm gonna to be providing an overview of a very exciting project, uh, our housing project with Edmonton Pride Seniors Group. Uh, it's been a huge amount of work over the past number of years. And uh, I just wanna give you an overview of, of, of what we're, how we got here. Um, why we're doing this, what what's the need is among our community, um, what we heard from uh, members of our community via surveys and focus groups, and workshops, and, um, and then more details from the survey and also what the housing will look like and where we are right now and what are the next steps. And first, I just want to acknowledge one of our uh, founding members, Robert Smith, um, tragically died this year. And this was a very, very important project to him. And I'm hoping we can honor his legacy and carry on um, from where he was. And I think he's probably watching us um, from above um, to see how we're doing. So Robert, here we go. So back into the closet, imagine how how uh, members of our community have been out for many years, gone through many trials and tribulations, and they reach in their senior years, wherever age that is, and all of a sudden would have to go back into the closet. How, how terrifying that would be. And, and here's, um, here's a quote from one of our, uh, we had focus groups with a number of members of our community and this is what they said this building would mean, uh, housing for um, our community. It would mean I could live in a community with like-minded individuals where we could thrive and where we wouldn't have to go back into the closet, where we could be who we are. And that's the important, the important issue, I think, is to be who we are. So, um, I mean, this project is going on for a number of years, but around 2018, 
uh, we were working with uh, a consultant from Communitas and we uh, review various housing approaches. There's many different types that can be um, rental, buying, cooperatives and so on to see what uh, our community is interested in. And we received, uh, we held a number of workshops and focus groups. Um, we brought people in from, from all over. We had it over at Community Task. We also have it over at the Ashburn. And we got uh, input from a, a lot of residents uh, via these focus groups. And then a very small, um, originally a small survey of uh, LGBTQ2S plus seniors. And from that, from that group and all that input, we developed a series of guiding principles. And I'll get into those in a few minutes, but just giving you an idea of what our, our process was. Um, after we did all that, then of course, uh, you know, we have to go from a concept to something that's real. And working with Communitas, which is our consultant, they've had a lot of experience over the years uh, in developing a not for a, uh, um, not-for-profit housing for many different groups in, in, in Edmonton. And they developed a feasibility study, which really the purpose of it was to look and see, is this possible? Is it economically viable? What would it look like? What would it cost? Um, we hired uh, at that time uh, an architect to design two different concepts of housing, just as to see what it could potentially look like. That doesn't mean necessarily that's what the final product will be. Um, and then we, we, then we decided that we really needed um, an input, more input from our community. And so we designed a survey that was going out to um, our, our community uh, members on a much broader um, perspective than we had done uh, before. The next major step after we got the survey, and I'll go into some, what we heard from that, was uh, we developed a prospectus, which is really um, quite a a slick, glossy presentation of everything to do with the project. And it's what you use when you're going to various um, partners, funding groups, and so on. It gives an overview of why we're doing this housing, what is the need, um, of obviously all the financial details of it, um, what, it what it would look like, um, what the, the rents would be like, and so on. So that when you're <clears throat> applying to, various programs that gives you an actual concrete overview of what um, this project is all about. And at the very end, I'll show you, if you haven't read <laughs> practice already, uh, it's on our website and I'll give you information how you can uh, uh, look that up. And, and in a couple of weeks time, I will be asking you a quiz on that perspective. So I want to make sure that you really read it carefully. Just joking. So, Understanding what, what's the need for this housing. Um, all seniors, you know, regardless, gay or straight, worry about uh, their housing needs as they age. Um, and it, we all want to stay in our homes as long as possible. That's a natural tendency for everybody to want to stay in our homes as long as possible. And then at, at an age in their life, seniors reach uh, a stage where they have to consider, well, um, can I stay in my own house or can I go somewhere else? Well, most seniors uh, just have to consider when am I going to do it? Is, is this the time now? But for us in our community, there are many other questions that um, other people have not considered. And interesting enough, um, I asked um, a number of my straight fans about issues about going into uh, what, what do they think uh, gay lesbian uh, seniors would face going into an, uh, another uh, type of housing and they, they couldn't come up with anything. Then I asked a number of my gay and lesbian friends, um, do you have any concerns or issues about that? And they said, well, hmm, I haven't really thought about it. Um, I don't know. Um, and then when we start hearing from some of the questions from our community, uh, certainly when we had our focus groups and workshops, um, people start asking, well, if I went to some housing with the staff and, and the other residents accept me for who I am? If I had a partner, if I don't have a partner, it doesn't really matter. But 
would I be able to live with my partner as a partner so that they know that is my partner, just like somebody else has a husband and wife? Um, can I live as myself? Would I face uh, harassment and discrimination um, in, in, in this new housing? And would, would people uh, assume my sexual orientation? Um, you know, so they have many other issues that other people probably have never thought about and, and didn't have to consider. So what did we hear from um, our, our groups, from the seniors that participated in our, in our groups? Well, they had worries about moving into seniors housing. I mean, having gone through, uh, and I'm sure many of you can identify through the last 20, 30 years, you know, we've had quite a struggle and we've come a long way. Uh, things are much better now than they were back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, so nobody wants to go back to that situation where we have to worry and be feeling scared. So they, they had um, fears of violence or harassment for residents. They don't know if that would happen, but they're saying, could that happen? Um, another issue is um, as we get older, of course, we need um, uh, other healthcare services and would they have to struggle to get the care they need? We also did a number of one-on-one uh, um, uh, -on -one interviews with a number of um, members of our community. And some of our um, people from the trans community very uh, yes, clearly said Appreciate that um, would, um, would, if I was in um, seniors housing, would I get the services that I need? Would they understand what my needs are? Would I even be able to tell them that I'm trans? Um, and so, uh, one of the, the, I think the key themes coming out from our groups is that I shouldn't have to be authentic to survive. I should be who I am. And you couldn't, shouldn't expect anything less. So what would this housing um, offer us? Um, I guess one of the top things would be that uh, we wouldn't have to worry about going back into the closet. No one wants to have that happen. That we would have a place to live comfortably, safely, that would be inclusive, um, that the people around me, the residents and any people providing um, home care, healthcare services would understand our needs and what our life experience would be. And basically just have a chance to feel like every other senior, um, that our, our identity, and our human rights are respected, and uh, we're th that we would have a choice when we, when we no longer have a choice, for example, to stay um, in our own. Okay, and I just want to check off with Kim. Uh, am I going too fast? Uh, is it okay? Good. I think that's maybe saying slow down a little bit. Okay. So our goal is, is more than housing. Um, yes, it is housing, but it wants, it, we want it to be bigger than that. Um, we want to build uh, a mixed income and I'll just uh, in a minute um, explain what that means, but safe, inclusive housing for LGBTQ2 plus seniors and importantly, we found from uh, the survey, the, the, the largest survey that we did recently, they just don't want just to be us, our community. They want their friends and allies. Um, uh, we don't want to be just divided off um, by ourselves. So that's, that's critically important. And that was quite a, a strong um, recommendation from, from our, what we got from our groups. And, um, some people probably assume when we say this housing is for our community, is it just for us or is it for other people too? And it is. And really we want to build a community so that it would provide um, programming both for the residents uh, in the building, but also their visitors and that it would become a gathering space for the broader community that we would have events there that would become sort of the go-to place um, for our community to gather together and have activities, have fun things, everything. And that 
I think that was very, very important. Now, when we were talking to people in the various focus groups and workshops, they, they wanted to be a, a happy place, a fun place. So just explaining mixed income. Uh, mixed income means that um, some of the units, uh, and, and, and uh, in this case, it would be rental units, uh, would be below market. So um, we found out, and I'll get into more detail later, that um, financial considerations are, are, are a key consideration of this housing. And the word affordable means that it's affordable to many different groups. So um, the definition used by CMHC, that's the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, is that um, 80% of market, so it would be 20% lower than what the market rate is in um, whatever neighborhood you happen to be in. Um, other units would be at higher rents. And to qualify for many different programs, both from uh, CMHC, uh, the city of Edmonton, and, and a lot of uh, um, various governmental groups, affordable housing means you have to have mixed income uh, to qualify. Uh, because as you're probably all aware, or maybe not be aware, there's a huge housing crisis all across the country. Uh, in the major cities, rural areas, and um, affordable housing is, is in, um, there's a great lack of it. And so that's why mixed income um, is a, a key requirement. So uh, as I indicated, we, we um, got input from all of our, our groups that we consulted with, and we developed some guiding principles. And for one, for example, if I had um, a partner, and if you don't, that's fine also. But if I, if I have a partner, I want that partner to be respected as my main caregiver. And that, that partner would be allowed to share a suite with my partner, just like anybody else. That the residents would want to feel included and respected. That they would be support groups available um, for our, our... This is a really good presentation. Thank you. Um, that there would be a very important social activities. Um, that's a, a critical component of, of, of people living together. And just a little story, when I worked with um, Alberta Health and we did a number of um, health uh, projects across the province. And one of them was um, exercise programs for seniors in, in um, assisted living and uh, long-term care facilities. And, and we had an evaluator would would be contacting um, the, the participants in the programs. And the, the reason Alberta Health Services wanted to do was obviously exercise is a very good thing for promoting health and extending your life and, and so on. But when they talked to the residents, they said, well, what's the number one reason you come to these exercise programs? And, and this program is still continuing in many facilities across Edmonton. And they said it was a social aspect. Uh, some of it gathered around their, their multicultural groups, uh, Chinese um, uh, community had programs and getting together with their friends was the number one thing that they enjoyed about it. Yes, they did exercise, but to get together with their peers was, was so important. So that's why social activities is a critical component of housing. That we would have strong anti-discrimination policies uh, regarding sexual orientation. So even though there's legislation in Canada to prevent uh, discrimination, as we all know, and certainly has happened a number of times even in our city, that doesn't mean that the behavior of everybody changes. And so having these policies in place is very critically important. And uh, even as important is that the staff, if there's uh, home care services being provided, that they have diversity training to work with and respect the residents. I just want to point out, one of our members of uh, Evan Pride Seniors Group uh, for the housing project is Lori Winder, who is the executive director of the Ashbourne. That's an assisted living um, housing uh, just across from the university, just off of 112th um, Street. And that is uh, probably the number one affirming housing um, uh, facility in Canada. And they've gone through extensive training with their staff. And so we're really proud to have 
Lori uh, uh, with our group and we respect and her input has been invaluable. But that is very important because often um, healthcare staff may not be uh, familiar with our community and what our specific needs are. So that uh, is a very important part of it. So the, the purpose of our, of our survey, the larger survey, uh, as our, our consultant, uh, Lynn Hanley indicated, she said, okay, we've heard from everybody and we want to have um, this housing, it's important to them. And these are the things, um, this is some of the amenities they want to have in their housing. But really, if you want to move forward, you have to actually confirm actual need and demand. Are there people now who, are committed to moving into this facility if it's built. And that is, she said, that's uh, critically important. If you want to get financing, you want to work with CMHC and so on. So that was probably our number one reason why we, we did this, this larger survey. Um, and really, and, and as you see from the results, it did confirm that there is actual need and there's actual demand. Uh, we want to confirm what uh, housing features are important to um, seniors? What was, it's not just an apartment, it's more than that. So what's important to them? We also knew uh, uh, that there are financial issues too. And so we had to ask um, uh, some, and it was interesting, we had to ask some very private questions um, of our respondents and they were very forthcoming about um, issues around finance and that really helped shape what this model of housing would look like, and then determine timing. When, when would they be prepared to move into um, um, such a facility? So, uh, so we, we developed a survey, went through many different iterations of questions. We sent it out um, during February, March, and April of 2020. Um, so it was ironic, just as the pandemic started, this is when <laughs> we, uh, sent out our survey, but fortunately we, you could do it online. Um, who did we send it out to? So we did a lot of work to make sure that we uh, contacted many members of our community. So we looked at, uh, we sent it to over 32 different uh, diverse um, social media and other community groups in our community, Facebook groups. So um, it included everything from the Pride Center uh, Team Edmonton, which is a, um, a gay and lesbian group in Edmonton for sports. Um, Prime Timers, um, Edmonton Vocal Minority, um, Fruits and Suits. Uh, those of you that are uh, in business, uh, maybe a member of that. It's a group of uh, business, and, and it's not just business, it's for social aspects of people in the community. And some of these groups had, you know, 1,500 or more followers. Um, we uh, made sure that we contacted the lesbian community. So uh, um, the Edmonton Lesbians for Fun and Friendship, uh, the Edmonton League of, Friend of Lesbians and uh, Edmonton Lesbian Event Network. And thank you to some of our, our members for um, contacting these groups. Some of these groups I joined and obviously I couldn't join the lesbian group, but uh, we made sure that we had people in our community that uh, could reach out to them. We also reached out to, uh, you know, key people in our community uh, that um, that people uh, know and respect. So obviously Murray Billet, Chris Wells over at U of A, um, um, Janice Irwin, one of our, our uh, MLAs from, from Edmonton. Um, so um, it was very important and to contact these people and, um, we also sent it to, of course, to the people who had participated in the various focus groups over the past number of years. Um, and it was really great, the, the moderators of all these various social media groups, uh, I know when I looked at my emails coming in, it was that the support from we received from everybody was so enthusiastic. Everyone said, this is a wonderful project. I'm sure I'll do all I can to make sure that I send out um, notification about this survey to the groups. And um, we got 212 responses from the community. Initially we had 199. And then we heard from some members of the community, well, I, I, I missed it. I didn't get to do the survey. So we opened it up again and we got um, additional uh, people. Um, 
So as I indicated, what we heard from the respondents that they want safe, inclusive housing for both us and our friends. Um, and a very important uh, uh, component of, of the survey showed that they, as we age, it was very important that we could provide health services to people um, as they need them. Um, and, and that was quite critical to everyone. Um, rental accommodation was the most preferred type of accommodation. And there was a small proportion that wanted to um, uh, buy, but rental was, was the number one, um, number one preference. And uh, along with these additional responses, we now have 60 people uh, and probably it's actually more because some of them are, are couples also, so it could be higher than 60, who want to move into the next four to six years. So that, that is very, very important when you're talking to funders, when you're talking about mortgages and everything, because that um, gives um, strong support for that we'll be able to fill this facility and, um, and, and make it financially feasible. Um, what type of apartments do they prefer? One bedroom in Dana was the most preferred um, type of accommodation, uh, followed by uh, one bedroom by itself and then two. Um, the preferred area uh, was the Oliver area. However, uh, as we're, uh, as I'll show you in a few minutes, we're looking at um, looking for land. Uh, we probably have to be um, uh, spread our search wider than just the Oliver area. Um, to see what land is available um, in, in the city. And very importantly, they said that it's, uh, it, we, they want it to be a gathering place for our community. So it's almost like a, a, a community center. And we looked at um, uh, other types of, again, lesbian housing in uh, other jurisdictions. I don't believe we didn't come across any in the rest of Canada, but we found um, examples in Boston, um, in New York City, San Francisco, and invariably all of those um, projects, um, a key component it was, it, was, it became the go-to place for the community, not just for the residents that are in the housing. Okay, what would the proposed building look like? This is not the actual building, this is just a picture, but it could look something like this. So uh, based on, and you know, we worked with an architect uh, to do some prototypes. Uh, obviously we have more work to do on that, but um, based on that, it would be about a low rise um, building, four to six stories. And, and that is important too, because uh, depending on the zoning in the city, there's certain restrictions about um, what you can build. It would be 50 units. Um, the feasibility report that Communitas um, prepared for us um, showed that it was financially sortable, supportable with the right mix of rental income, um, obviously grants and other equity partnerships with, with various other groups. Um, the approximate cost, I know it sounds huge. It is huge, uh, 25 million, um, but um, that's what the cost would be for this type of housing, and uh, we intend to get there. Um, it would require three, three average lots, so it's about 18 to 20,000 square feet to, to put uh, that size of the building on that piece of land. Um, it would also include um, parking, which was uh, very critical for uh, our respondents too. And then of course, uh, it's more than just the apartments, obviously, the general space for other amenities that would create in a community center. And, and what, would, what, would, what would it look like? But as, so uh, out of the 50 units, um, based on what the uh, people uh, indicated in the survey, this is the proportion that wanted each one of these. So uh, 24 wanted a one bedroom and den. Uh, 14 wanted uh, one bedroom and 12 um, wanted two bedrooms. Um, full kitchen and, and laundry, and laundry in each person's apartment was very critical. Uh, nobody wants to have to go down to another floor to do their laundry. So that would be, so all that is costed in there. That it would have a dining room and a commercial kitchen uh, so that meals could be prepared um, if people wanted to have their meals down there as opposed to in um, their own units that it would have multi-purpose rooms 
for community events. Um, so that would be open both to residents and to members of a community. This is where we would hold various events. Obviously a lobby, um, sitting kind of a slash cafe area was very important. And, and another thing is that we made sure in the design that there would be space for offices for um, if and when home care services are needed to be provided, there was to be offices for that staff um, to uh, come in and um, provide the services. So, um, and it would be universal design. And what, what, what's universal design? Universal design is, is a concept that's used in seniors housing uh, that makes it, um, makes it amenable for everybody. So it would have larger door frames, uh, that the bathroom would be wide enough so that if people had walkers or wheelchairs, you could move around uh, and, and room to maneuver. Um, it could mean, for example, that there would be handrails uh, in the hallway, but as one of our members pointed out, you can make them look really pretty so it, it doesn't look like uh, a hospital uh, handrail. You can make it look very nice. And the nice thing about universal design is um, that it looks just like anybody else's apartment, but it just has these features in place that make it easier to um, maneuver around if, if anybody, uh, as we age, will have um, difficulties with um, walking and mobility and so on. And we certainly heard from uh, people that um, when you're trying to transform a, an existing building and it doesn't have that, it makes it really, really difficult. So you build that in um, before you need it so that when you need it, it's there. Now, uh, in, in, in the presentation last uh, two weeks ago from Michael, I, there was a question about um, home care services. Um, that's a critical piece of our model and that uh, they would be provided as needy. Um, one of the, one of the uh, uh, and maybe in the beginning, there might not be much need for it. And then as time goes on, there's more need. Um, one of the potential uh, uh, funding delivery models uh, would make it better than, right now, home care, uh, uh, you have to be assessed by Alberta Health Services to see what type of services you need. And then there's, if, if you qualify for it, they provide services one-on-one -on -one between a home care and delivery person and in your home. But a, a better model uh, would be uh, the pool of funding provided by Alberta Health Services. And the Ashburn is a very good example of this, that that's what they do there. So that um, by pooling the funding that's allocated to each person that um, is eligible for home care services, you can hire your own home care staff. Um, it provides continuity to services and in healthcare continuity is critically important that people know who their home care provider is and more importantly, their home care provider knows their needs and wants, and it's consistent as opposed to uh, home care right now where you could get a different person every week. Um, so th these services would be managed by an experienced um, building manager. Um, an, an example of, of this kind of uh, support is, I don't know if you're familiar with ArtSpace, they have, a, it's a group in Edmonton uh, composed of artists and retired artists. They have housing that is at the top of the hill just above um, Riverdale. Uh, and it's 88 units. Um, uh, it's a high rise and then uh, townhouse units. It's a mixed income one. So various rents dependent on people's ability to pay. And some of the units have been specifically built for persons with physical disabilities. And they have a, a program called SAIL uh, which stands for Supports for Art Space Independent Living. And they pulled their funding uh, and that's enabled them to provide 24 hour support uh, for the residents. And the residents in that um, housing have much higher needs than uh, potentially what we would have in our group, but it shows how you could uh, pull the resources and receive much more care than you otherwise would be if you were just doing it one and one, you wouldn't be able to have 24 hour support. So it works very well for them. Um, proposed rents. So um, we found that uh, from the survey that um, um, 
people indicated that um, affordability is a key issue and that uh, about 45% said they couldn't afford more than $1,400 per month or less. So therefore it would be mixed income um, rents uh, makes it more affordable uh, to income residents and <clears throat> to lower income residents, sorry. And some examples of the rents that we did, we did a market uh, assessment for the Oliver area. It may be different from for other areas of the um, city, but it'd be approximately 820 for a one bedroom, 900 for a one bedroom and den, and 1,000 for a two bedroom. Um, other units would be at market rates because you have to balance the revenue coming in uh, to make this affordable. And of course, the, the market rates um, depend on the neighborhood. Who are our partners? We can't, we can't do this alone. We have a number of partners uh, that we've been working with. Um, SAGE, which provides uh, a, a broad range of services for Edmonton seniors. Their, um, their building is just across from the city hall. And uh, the Garneau United Assisted Living, which is really the Ashburn. Um, they are a key partner uh, with us. And we uh, are, have been working with both of these groups over the past number of years. And, um, and tend to, to solidify stronger relationships with them. It's, it's critical when you are applying for funding that you um, are with um, other organizations that have experience in housing. The city of Edmonton is another key partner um, for, for land. Um, and we, uh, the city of Edmonton has a, a program um, for affordable housing for various groups um, and one of the groups would be our community being lesbian community um, and <clears throat> they own property in various parts of the city and we're looking at um, potential um, opportunities with them um, why communications is a, a, a communications um, consulting group that we are working with and the perspectives that you can see on our website was prepared by them. It looks quite nice and slick um, and as a marketing tool. And we provided all the information from our consulting and all our workshops and survey to feed into that, that um, document. And then also CMHC, which is the Canadian Mortgage and Housing um, Foundation. And they administer, there's a national program called the Federal National Co-Housing Investment Fund. And that's a multi-year uh, program really to help fund uh, affordable housing across Canada. And there's a huge shortage of, of housing across Canada. And there's a many different uh, funding streams available within that um, investment fund, including low cost mortgages, which of course we would need um, to finance our housing. Uh, then also uh, other components, including seed funding, which is funding that they provide to not-for-profit groups like us to submit the application because it's quite complex. There's many different things you have to do in submitting the application uh, to do uh, this housing. So what's the next steps? Number one is finding land. Finding land is, the, is our key next step. And when we looked at uh, other projects in the United States, um, the catalyst for the project becoming real for everybody was when they found land. When they found land, they all report, they said, everyone thought, okay, this is real. This is going to happen. Um, it's not just a concept on paper. Um, that's me skiing out in Devon, in case you're wondering where that is. I think I was thinking about land when I was cheering right there. Anyway, that's our, our number one current task right now. Um, so, um, and when we have, we've hired a consultant, I think, uh, where's, I'm just going down to see, Harvey is there, I believe. Wave your hands, Harvey. Uh, he's helping us look at various opportunity, opportunities for land um, right now, currently with, um, with the city of Evan to see what's available for us. So we have to connect with more members of our community. We know we didn't reach everybody. Um, so um, opportunities like this today, to, and please, please, please uh, indicate to your friends if they haven't heard about our project, let them know about it and how they can participate. Uh, so there's still lots of many complex steps yet to do. 
Uh, one exciting thing that we just started, um, uh, literally yesterday, I guess, uh, we have a small group. We're looking at uh, developing a fundraising campaign. And you know who will be coming to for that, you guys. So uh, we still have a lot of details to work out, but it's very important that when you're applying for grants that you have raised some funds for uh, your housing to go along with various grants and, and, um, and programs from other organizations. So lots of other steps. I won't go through all of them, but um, there's lots of financial and engineering, architecture and land permits and zoning. Um, just looking at Michael's face right now, it's gonna make our heads spin, but we will get there. We will get there. Um, we have a lot yet to do, but we've come a long way. So as I indicated, uh, this is our, our website, Edmonton Pride Seniors Group, epsg.ca. Just Google it and you'll see the housing survey summary there and also our perspectives. You can just click on it and you can download it or you can read it online. Of course, we're on uh, social media and I just wanna do a shout out to Ron who's on the line right now. Hi, Ron. He's done great work for us. So we're, we're uh, we're in the 21st century. So we're on Facebook and Instagram and our handle is at Edmonton Pride Seniors. We're also on Twitter. Some of you may or may not use this, but um, this is where you can find out uh, 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 lots of details on where we're going in the future. So that's my piece. Uh, Larry, over to you. Um, Thank you very much, Blair. And if either you or Kim could stop screen sharing, uh, then I'll be able to to see everyone. And here is everyone. Wow, uh, there's a lot I'm of people. Gonna look first, we've got a lot of people. We, uh, I think we've uh, not got anything that hasn't been answered on the uh, the other. So I will go to. Are there any questions? Anyone who hasn't given a signal, I think you can unmute yourself. Uh, Larry? Okay, I, I have a me... question. Okay. It's there. Um, there, okay. I will, uh, um, yeah, please go ahead there. So I'm 70. When is this building going to be built? You don't Doesn't matter, it. and thank you very much. You look, lo look lovely in your red sweater. Um, <laughs> but I'm 70. I have no idea how long I will remain independent. So my question is, um, how long is it going to take to get this building built and for me to be able to consider as a resident? Well, I don't know if we can give an exact number for that. We're working as hard as we can uh, to make this happen, and we hope um, that it will be built before um, before some of us do need it. So um, we're working as hard as we can. And I, we, I think if we're diligent and, and um, keep moving forward, we can make this happen. Sure, and, and I appreciate that. And so as, as a member of the funding committee, uh, uh, I, I wanna say to everybody on this call, somebody in Edmonton could stroke a check for 2 million today. That could get us property. If we don't find somebody that will stroke a check for $2 million today, then our funding committee has committed to spend time until December of next year raising cash and commitments. And hopefully in that time, we will have $2 million plus to buy this property, whether it's land or a perfect ideal spot that we can just kind of open Rent, put rent signs on the lawn and start seeking uh, registrations. If we have to build, then it seems to me that it, to, it, it, between now and December next year, we're also going to be finding uh, granting applica application sources, funding sources, so that we will be able to come up with some construction costs. And at a certain point in time, we can take our land and some of our initial funding and go to a traditional lending source. And so one, it's, you know, once the, the, the dominoes start to fall, it happens quite quickly. So if any of you know somebody out there that can stroke a check for $2 million. Or less. Or less. Um, but we, we don't have the capacity today to take that money, but within the next few weeks, we'll have the agreements in place and we will actually be able to accept donations. 
So um, beyond that, as soon as we get the land and we have an address, it's probably within our reach to build a building and make it available for renters um, within 24 months. So this could be done in 2023, 24, 25, or 26, if we all get on board. So Blair, great presentation, super Thank information. You. Thanks for pulling 18 Thank months you. of information together. Data. Um, uh, Roy had a question regarding the size of the apartments. Can you make any comment on that or is it too, too detailed? Uh, no, just give me a second, Roy, and I'll, I'll uh, see if I can quickly look it up. What the, um, and we knew that was, a, that was a critical piece that they would be uh, of a reasonable size. I believe it was around, um, here it is, yeah. Mm. The, the one bedroom would be uh, uh, 650 square feet, uh, one den plus, one bedroom plus den was 750 and two bedroom was 900. And actually uh, Lynn Hanley indicated that's pretty generous, not only for uh, like some of the new buildings happening in Oliver right now, um, like the McLaren, you know, they're really high end places. They're much smaller than that. Um, so it is a generous size and Apartments now in Vancouver, we're talking sometimes 300 square feet. So um, th this is a good size. Smaller than of course, where you're living now in your house, but obviously uh, uh, you have to make some uh, changes to your life. Good. I have a, also a question from Joan. Uh, who says that home care is a key issue for this project to work when it's up and running. And she makes a suggestion, and I guess a part of question about implementing AI robotic technology as an aid for independent living. Has the committee considered any of these initiatives? Robotics. Yeah, robotics, artificial intelligence, the things that will enhance mobility and quality of life in general. Yeah, and uh, I don't think we've actually specifically talked about that, but we certainly probably want to use um, technology. One of the things that um, Laurie from the Ashburn indicated that you want to have um, high-speed internet everywhere because a lot of different electronic um, services for health depend on that. So that would be a, a piece of, um, that would be an important component of the building. And having worked in health, I know there's, there's a number of uh, monitoring devices that work on Wi-Fi, such as monitoring your blood sugar, your um, blood pressure, and so on, that you can send remotely to your healthcare providers. So um, yes, we would certainly be looking into something like that. And who knows what may be coming up along the, uh, as, as things move forward, but that, that's a, a very good uh, suggestion, yes. Yeah. I don't see anyone's hand raised virtually or uh, however. Is there anyone who has a question that I'm missing? Uh, I see Gianna asked about balconies. Yes, there will be balconies. Uh, yeah, do you want to answer that question uh, uh, then, Blair? Yeah, we had a huge debate over balconies and uh, yes, there will be. Um, that does add um, costs to the building, but uh, there's new new ways to, uh, because they lead to a lot of heat loss and everything, but there's ways to mitigate that now. And so balconies, yes, would be very important because people indicated that green space, um, that places to get outside of your own unit were very important for them. And so that would be included uh, in the design. If anyone has another question, do that or use the, uh, uh, the uh, hand waving icon. Uh, Michael. Yes, uh, thank you. I just wanted to add a little bit relates to the last question and further is, is that, that the other thing that we indicated uh, if you go through the whole prospectus is that we'd also look for, for the possibility of some, uh, some funding in terms of uh, making sure that the building uh, was uh, met the highest uh, environmental standards. And the federal government is providing a fair bit of money in terms of the kind of heating that you would have, uh, the insulation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
And so that's another place that would likely, there would some possibility that would also some funding would come with that as well. So I just add that in. Thanks. That's right. Yeah, Mike, well, actually in our perspective, in the uh, perspectives and also the uh, feasibility report, uh, Lynn had provided a number of details that uh, the way we would build this building would reduce the energy consumption by something like 60 to 80 percent. And, and actually, uh, looking at the Canadian Mortgage and Housing um, eligibility, uh, besides mixed income, you have to have a green building. That, that's a requirement, which is what we should be doing for everything from now on, given the issue of global warming and everything. So uh, thanks for mentioning that, Michael. Yes, underground uh, parking will be available. Roy. Uh, Jana or Kirsten, did you have a question? Uh, uh, Robert, thank you uh, uh, again for, for being here. It's nice that we are having this uh, interprovincial presence. Yep, so, no other questions. So, so thank you. Thank you for being here and welcome from Saskatchewan. Yes. Bill has a question, I believe. Uh, yes. yes, go ahead and answer, will you please? Or ask your question, please. Sure. Will there be any kind of recreational facilities like a workout room or anything like that? Um, yes, that was one of the things that um, respondents asked for. Would there be an exercise room? And so um, there's potential for having that as a uh, part of the plans too. Um, exercise and recreation was a critical, um, uh, a critical requirement um, for the building and, uh, and also, as I indicated, very good for health. Um, so I, uh, we'll be signing you up, Bill, for the yoga program. Well, I'm, I think I'm, I'm, my arthritis has a little, got me a little past yoga, but I certainly be into some other things. Oh, uh, we'll, we'll work something out for you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Warren, you have a question about the uh, old municipal lands. Do you want to ask that? Yeah, I was just uh, thinking about the municipal airport lands. And I know there's been lots of uh, ideas for how that land's going to be developed. Um, and I don't know whether there's an opportunity for this particular uh, building to be placed in that land. Uh, yes, we actually heard from uh, Michael's a close friend of Don Iverson, the mayor, and he had indicated uh, not right this year, but there probably will be um, some opportunities for affordable housing. It's called Blatchford, the, the whole piece of land around the airport. So there could potentially be opportunities for land um, at Blatchford, not right this year, but maybe in the future. So um, I'm sure Harvey's got that on his list also to look at. Thank you. Uh, it was an early question and uh, they uh, answered it in part, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll throw it to you, Blair, as well about the old Mount Royal school site. Uh, that school has just closed, is that? Uh, anything that has been considered. I think that's the question. There was a school in the Highlands, is it not? Yes, yeah. that's right. 112th Avenue. Yes, um, correct. Yeah, uh, we'll put that on the list. Uh, it, in fact, I guess it sounds like it just closed recently. Um, so that would probably be part of the inventory of uh, the city of Edmonton. So we will put it on the list. Um, we hadn't specifically thought about that, but um, that could be a potential one also. Some of the some of the site some of the land sites that um, the city of Edmonton owns sometimes they're way way out in industrial areas and so on so it may not be uh, amenable but uh, I guess if if we don't build in Oliver and maybe another area um, and I forgot to mention the people had indicated that what was critical to them is close to transit buses or the LRT. Walkability was very, very important to them, being able to go to grocery stores. So we will have to take all those um, uh, needs into consideration to look at what's appropriate um, land for us, because you, you want to make it a community, you want to make it uh, a good place to live. So. Thanks, Blair. We're at five minutes to the hour, so I will take one further question or comment from Don Carter. 
Hi. <clears throat> Sorry I missed most of your presentation, Blair. I, I had a meeting to go to, but it was really nice to uh, catch the Q&A and um, see how you're answering these questions. Um, my question is, now that we have Mayor-elect um, Amarjeet Sohi uh, in office, one of the things that he had talked about um, in uh, a separate meeting that I had with him and some other organizations is reviving um, the idea of having a 2S LGBTQ plus committee as part of the city of Edmonton. And I was just wondering, um, in light of that, what uh, will be the group's approach to Mayor Sohi now that he's in the office? And what are your expectations of him when it comes to the housing project? Maybe I'll let Michael answer that one, Michael. Unmute. Yes. Um. Uh. Thanks. And and thanks for the the uh, the question. Um. I, I think the the uh, uh, the new mayor is is um, uh, quite aware. Uh, I've talked with them a number of times during the campaign and before and and will afterwards. Um. I think at this point, um, being brand new, he is likely in the next number of months to look at a committee, as you've mentioned. I, I think it'd be unlikely before January that that will happen since the city will deal with its budget. Uh, but uh, in terms of other things that he may be supportive of, I think there, uh, I think there are also a couple of members of council that are interested in this project and our project specifically that, that I think will uh, help bring that forward as well. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Actually, thank you, Michael. Uh, and just one more point, Larry. Uh, Ann Stevenson just got elected in O'Dayman. Um, she worked with Right at Home Housing, and we've, we've uh, had many meetings with Ann already. They have a long track record of, of affordable housing, so uh, it's wonderful to have her on council. So I think, uh, as I told Jen, I think the stars are aligning. Oh, okay. Thank you, uh, thank you, Blair. I'm I'm pleased that she is she is my counselor. I, I do want to thank you for a uh, what really was an excellent talk, Blair. And uh, the size of the audience and the number of questions indicates uh, the degree of interest in this. I'd also like to thank Kim Lorraine for signing and for technical assistance, and to thank everyone who uh, who came. I hope that we will see you next week, same time, same place, when our speakers, and it's a pair, um, will be uh, Jackie Ford and Murray Billet, who will have a conversation about educating the media on GLBTQ2S plus uh, issues. So I hope we, we, all, we see you uh, all there. And I'd further ask a favor, the, my standard, request we will be sending you out a short evaluation questionnaire we would ask please that you fill it out and return it to us since uh, your opinions really are crucial to us for in planning future meetings if you need to contact us you can reach us at aging with pride at pride center of edmonton.ca and now i return the meeting to the host uh, and again thank you all Hello, everyone. Thank you for all coming. We will see you next week at 11 a.m.